Topic today, um, one of the uh, community members suggested that I speak about the parent child relationship. As we have, mashallah, many youth here, we also have many parents here. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what does the ulum of the Ahl Bayt, what does the Quran teach us about this relationship between parents and children. It right? doesn't matter if you have sons, daughters, a mix of both, this will be applicable to you. So I made the speech two parts, inshallah. The first part is going to be geared towards the children, the youth. Right? The youth is you know, anybody who doesn't have kids of their own, right? You're a youth, okay? Everybody who has kids, then they would be considered adults, right? Or parents. So the speech is in two parts. The first is for youth. The second part is for adults. And because of the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, focus on the fazail and I'll leave the uh, masaib to Mawlana, inshallah. Uh, please recite of uh, salawat. <laughs> I'm talking again to the youth, right? I'm going to start off with the kids, the youth in our community. And so I want all the, all the youth, especially the youth, uh, the boys and the girls as well, to be paying attention to this part especially. So when we look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the world, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created difference and diversity, right? He hasn't made everything the same. He's made people of different ethnicities. He's made people of different colors. He's made people of different, actually allowed people to be different religions. You know, people who are Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, etc. right? He's made people who are black, people who are brown, men, women, etc. So one of the ways that he has created this dunya that we know is that he's made difference, right? Now, does the, qu the question arises, does that, is that, does that difference that he's created, does that mean that we should now treat everybody the same? Right? Does it mean that now that there's this difference established, we should be treating everybody exactly the same? Right? And the answer to that is obviously no. Right? If you saw, for example, a 30-year-old man who was muscular, he was crossing the street holding a bag of groceries, and then you see a 90-year-old grandmother also trying to cross the street with the groceries, you're going to treat them differently. Right? You're going to want to help the lady who's older, and you probably won't help the 30-year-old man who's trying to cross the street. Right? Or similarly, if somebody is poor, somebody's homeless and he comes up to you and he looks very haggard and run down and he asks you for ten dollars right but on the other hand then there's a rich neighbor that you have and he asks you for ten dollars right you're not going to have the same response to them you're going to be more likely to give it to the person who's homeless right so this tells us this shows us that in fact we shouldn't we don't always treat people despite this difference in diversity we're not always treating people exactly the same right there are different levels as to um, how we are supposed to treat people and different stations that different people have. And we have this teaching in our faith that um, certain groups of people are given extra respect, extra ihtiram, extra importance. And one of the groups of people, um, inshallah, that if the youth can uh, pay attention for this part, one of the groups that is given particular importance in Islam and that we've been asked to treat better than others is our parents, right? No matter how old they are, no matter if we think that they're wrong about something, no matter if, in fact, they might even be doing something wrong, we still have to honor them, we still have to respect them, we still have to love them. Okay? Now here the question might arise, Sadala Muhammad Allah, 
the question might arise in our mind that why do we have to have goodness? Why do we have to have this ihsan towards our parents, right? This is what I've said, that we need to have this goodness and love and ihsan towards your parents. So why do we need to have this, right? The answer to this question is, let's think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes, right? What are the main two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we recite at the beginning of every surah? Can one of the youth tell me? Okay, so that's the ayah. So what are the attributes? Yes. Yeah, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. And what does that mean? Anybody know? Okay. Merciful. The merciful, right? So every day in prayer, we're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy towards, you know, towards us, towards all of creation, right? But how exactly do we see that mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful? We see that mercy not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, you know, He doesn't descend gifts down onto us. He doesn't shower us with, you know, gifts from the sky and food. You know, maybe if we are Prophet Isa, then we'll one day have a maqam where we can also get food from the sky. But for most of us, we're not at that place, right? He shows us his mercy because the parents that he's given us are a manifestation of his mercy, right? Through the fact that he has given us parents who love us and take care of us, we know that he's merciful, right? So our parents, they carried us, you know, our mother carried us in the womb, right? She fed us, they fed us when we couldn't even lift a morsel of food to our mouth. They changed our, you know, undergarments when we had dirtied them. They provided shelter for us from the elements outside. They bought us clothes, they took us, they educated us, they took us to school. And they continue to do these things until we reach adulthood. And in fact, it's mercy because nobody's telling them to do this, right? If someone was telling them to do this, then we wouldn't say that that's not mercy, right? That's something else. But nobody's saying that you must take this kid and go there, right? The fact that they're doing this out of their love for you shows that they have this mercy towards you. And that's ultimately a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. So I'd like to hear, share, hear for the youth, I'd like to share a brief story. And if you've been attending my majalis, you know that I like to sprinkle in stories into the majalis because I think that, you know, sometimes people get, if it's too academic or too much of a lecture, then people start getting tired. So there's a little bit of a story I'd like to share about um, a kid, a, a boy, a young boy, who complained about his father, okay? So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the story is as follows, that my father, my dad only had one eye, you know, he was an embarrassment to me. There was this one day during elementary school where my dad came to say hello to me and I was so embarrassed. How could he do this to me? I ignored him and I threw him, you know, a hateful glance and I ran away. The next day at school, one of my classmates said, Oh my God, your dad only has one eye, right? And I wanted to bury myself. I also wanted my dad to just disappear. So then I confronted him that day and I said, Dad, if you're going to make people make fun of me, then why don't you just go away, right? So my dad didn't respond to this comment of mine. And I didn't even think about what I had said because I was so angry at my dad. I was oblivious to his feelings, and I wanted to get out of that house I was living in and have nothing to do with my dad. And so I studied hard, and then I got married, and then I bought a house of my own, and eventually I had kids of my own, and I was happy with my life, okay? And all the comforts of my life. And then one day my dad comes to visit me, and he hadn't seen me in years, and he hadn't even met his grandchildren at that point. When he stood by the door, my children laughed at him for having one eye, and I yelled at him for coming over uninvited. I screamed at him, how dare you come to my house and scare my children? Get out of here right now. And to this, my father quietly answered, oh, I'm sorry, I might have gotten the wrong address. And he left. Now one day, a letter regarding a school reunion came to my house. So I told my wife, I lied, I said I was going on a business trip. And after the reunion, I went back to my old house just out of curiosity where my dad used to live. My neighbor said that my father had passed away. He's died. I did not shed a single tear. They handed me a letter. They said, your father wanted you to have this letter. They, he, I opened the letter and the letter said, my dearest son, I think about you all the time. I'm sorry that I came to your house and I scared your children. I was so glad when I heard that you were coming for the reunion. I'm sorry that I was a constant embarrassment to you when you were growing up. You see, when you were very little, you got into an accident and you lost your eye. And as a father, I couldn't stand watching you having to grow up with one eye. And so I had surgery performed to give you an eye of mine. And I was so proud of my son, who was seeing a whole new world for me in my place with that eye. With all my love to you, your father. 
So this is a story about you know the importance of the sacrifices that our parents make for us that sometimes we don't realize you know as children when we're oblivious to the things that are happening around us. But you know our parents may not have given an eye, but there's all kinds of hidden sacrifices and commitments that they're doing for us, and you know that we might not even know until afterwards. Salaam Muhammad. So how should we treat our parents? Right? So in the Quran, how do we treat our parents? Now that we've established that you know we need to have this love for our parents, this ihsan, this goodness towards our parents, how do we treat them? So in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Mahal, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَخَذَا رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ That God has ordained that you not worship anything except for Him. Don't do ibadah of anything except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ right? إِحْسَانًا your God has ordained, He's made it a requirement for you that you do not have to ibadah of anybody except for God. <coughs> and also, in addition to that, you do ihsan towards your parents, right? When one of them reaches old age, or both of them reach old age, then don't say to them, uff, okay? Don't say to them, uff, and do not push them away, but speak to them with holan karima. Speak to them with kindness, good words, right? Easy words. Okay, now, what does uff mean, right? So, a lot of people wonder, what does uff mean, right? And in other languages, the word of is kind of an expression of disgust, right? And if you speak Arabic, they use of. If you speak uh, Urdu, they, they use of, but we're not really used to that, right? So of is actually just a word that means any sort of expression of disgust or hatred. If you're just saying, go away, you know, I don't want to deal with this right now, you say of, okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't say of to your parents, right? Now, in this verse, he's saying, don't say of, but then does that mean that, you know, because he didn't say that we can yell at our parents, you know, because that's not in the verse. Does it mean that we can raise our voice to our parents? Does it mean that we should argue with our parents? Does it mean that we can, God forbid, you know, physically put our hands on our parents? What do you guys think? No, right? So what the scholars of Quran say is that this verse is an example of something called qiyas awlawiyah. That just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that concept means that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said don't stay off, then by this concept of Qiyas al we know that anything that's above that is also not permitted, right? Anything that's worse than Uf, you also can't do. You cannot raise your voice to parents, you cannot put your hands on your parents, you cannot argue, you know, incessantly with your parents, etc. Conversation is okay, but you can't do anything worse than Uf. You can't roll your eyes and look away, you can't, you know, become angry at for no reason with them all the time, etc., etc. Similarly, that's the verse of Quran. Right? What traditions do we have? What traditions from, do we have from the ulum of Ahlul Bayt about how we can show this respect and kindness to our parents? Okay. So some of the things we have in the hadith of Ahlul Bayt is that when our parents enter the room, one of the ways we can respect them is just to stand up. Right? Stand up and show that respect for them. When they come home, you should always, as the children, you should always say salam to your parents. Right? Give them salams, give them a hug, show them that you're welcoming them. And when you're walking behind them, we have hadith, that actually you should walk behind your parents. Walk behind your father when you're walking behind him. Don't walk in front of them. Right? These are small, very small things that, you know, they, they seem minuscule, but they'll inculcate a sense of respect and love and ihtiram for your father or your mother if you practice them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And finally, what else can we do to build a better relationship with our parents? Well, it's really simple, right? Try to talk to your parents, okay? Try to build a relationship with them, share your life with them, okay? Tell them about your day. Tell them if someone or something is bothering you. Ask them about their work, ask them about their day. What did they do today, etc. Ask them about their childhood. Where did they grow up? You know, who were their friends, etc. Right? Ask for their advice if you're struggling in school or anything else. Get to know them, right? Um, so now again, because time is short, I'm keeping my remarks a little bit short. But inshallah, from there, I would like to move on now to some of the guidance and some of the um, teachings that we have from the Quran and Ahlul Bayt about the other side of the relationship. Right? How do parents 
Um, and again, I'm just scratching the surface of this topic. This is not a comprehensive you know, discussion here. These are just some basic akhlaqi points that we can keep in mind to help keep this relationship strong. Okay? So now we're going to look at the other side of the relationship. What can the parents do towards their children to keep that relationship strong? So we see that parents in Islam have get, been given two different responsibilities. Right? One is physical. Okay? So take care of their food, provide their clothing, provide their shelter, etc. Right? And that's also an obligation in Islam for, for the parents of the children. That's a very important obligation. right? But in fact, for many of us, that's a very natural thing to do. Right? When you're a father, when you're a mother, you want to provide food, shelter, and clothing for your children. It doesn't take any extra effort to want to do that. Right? But we see that in Islam, the father and the mother have also been given the requirement for the spiritual and the emotional tarbiyah of the child, the uh, development and upbringing of the child. Right? So how do we know that we have this duty? Well, in Surah, to, in Surah to Tahrim, we have this verse, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara, wa kudu had nasu wal hijara, sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This verse says that, O oh, you people of Iman, you people who have Iman, protect yourselves and protect your families from a fire whose fuel is men and stones. Right? So we see in this verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that um, for people who have Iman, He's not saying just protect yourself from you know, the eternal punishment. Don't protect yourself from this adab, but also protect your families. Okay? And similarly, we see in other places in Quran, I'm just giving some very brief arguments here, but in Surah Al-Luqman, we see that Hazrat Al-Luqman, one of the things that he does is that he's giving his son spiritual <laughs> advice, ethical advice, moral advice. Right? He's not just, we don't just learn that Luqman gave his son clothes. Right? He says that, you know, Luqman says to his son that whatever musibah falls upon you, then you should have sabr. Right? He says that don't turn away from people in arrogance. Don't turn your face from people in arrogance. So these are ethical teachings. Right? These are akhlaqi teachings. Right? So we see that you also, as a parent, you have that responsibility. When we establish that we have this responsibility as parents, then we need to ask ourselves, how do we go about cultivating that tarbiyah? How do we go about raising them the right way? And before I talk about how we raise them the right way, and again, I want to say here that I am a father, um, and I am you know, also trying to implement this, but I have a very young child, and so I'm not an expert here. Um, so you know, take this with a grain of salt, and if your experience is better than this, then please follow that, or speak to Oman or other ulama. I'm just sharing some things that I've learned that is in the ulum of Quran and Apple Okay, So some of the, so some, for before we talk about what those things are, I want to talk about some of the misguided ideas that people have about this tarbiyat al this raising of the children, right? how we do this. Okay? So some people have this idea that the children are basically like our property, right? that we have the right to just basically boss them around, tell them what they, whatever they have to do, and they have to obey us no matter what. Right? And actually under Sharia, that's not correct. You know? Your Sharia, if you look at the Risala of Sayyid Sistani, for example, he doesn't say that the children owe their parents absolute obedience. Yes, they do owe obedience in some cases, but there are exceptions to that. It's not an absolute, you know, 100%, whatever you say goes, etc. Right? They're not property. They do have the right to be treated respectfully and kindly. And in fact, one of the ways that we see that they're not property is that in the Sharia, we have this concept of Wilayat al Mal. Okay? Wilayat al Mal means that. When the child, that as the wali of the child, as the caretaker of the child, you have authority over the child's finances, right? So if the child, you know, for example, has been given gifts, you actually have the right uh, to control the money that the child has. But there's an important condition in this. And the condition that the fuqaha give is that when you're controlling their expenses, you have to do it in at least in the interests of the child or so that it's not against the interests of the child. Meaning that if he's getting money from relatives, you can't just now take this money and say that now I'm going to spend this, you know, on my, uh, you know, new new suit or something like that. Right? You have to save it for something that's related to that child, that's in that child's interest. Right? So that shows us that if this was just your property, then of course you could take the money and just do what you want with it. Right? That's the definition of property. Right? You have that right of ownership. Right? But with a child. You're just a caretaker, right? You're a wali. And so the money that he has, you have a responsibility to use it in his interest. Okay? The second way that people sometimes raise their children and that doesn't work in our society 
is what we call the Sunday school phenomenon. Okay, Sunday school phenomenon. And this is where the parents, they think that the spiritual and the ethical and the moral tarbiyah of their children will be taken care of by the Sunday school teachers, right? Mashallah. So I'm going to go and I'm going to have my chai and play cricket and go to the mall and these people will teach my children Islam. Okay, that's the mentality that some people have. And in fact, that some people, those, that mentality also does work in some countries, right? If you go to places like India and Pakistan and Iran, right? You have so many other institutions in the society that are also raising your children, right? You have family members, you have the schools, you have masajid, you have, you know, jaloos that's happening in the streets that, in fact, if you as the parents don't invest as much time, it's okay because the society around you is reinforcing the same things that you want to teach. Or at the very least, you know, for example, in India, it's predominantly a Hindu culture. There are many things that we disagree with. But at least some of the moral and ethical teachings of that culture are not are closely aligned with Islam, right? Um, they're not completely antithetical to Islam. Whereas now we're living in a secular society, so we have to be more involved and more prepared, right? It's like if you are sending your children into a jungle, right? This is kind of like the society we're living in. If you're sending them to a jungle, you would give them some sort of supplies, right? To help them survive for a certain amount of time. You wouldn't just say, okay, go. You know, this is what you have to do. It's about how do we actually um, engage in this tarbiyah, right? And so one of the things that I'd like to share, I'd like to share just two points here, two very basic points, and then I'm going to wrap up, inshallah. So the two points are very simple, very basic, but um, this is a reminder, right? I'm not teaching anybody anything new. I'm just reminding you of things that you already know, but that are very important. Right? So I'd like to start this first. There's two points. The first point about, I think, what's really important in the tarbiyah of children in the West, I'd like to share it again with a story, okay? just as I told a story. So the story is that there was a young man, right? And he was married and he had a son, okay? And he would work late, right? He would work late into the night, okay? And, you know, he was just a young professional type person and he had a young son. Okay, and when he came home, often his wife was asleep, right? So one day he came home and as normal, his wife was asleep. You know, his dinner was on the table, okay? And he sees that his young son, who's actually supposed to be sleeping, has come and his son is waiting for him in the kitchen. And he picks up his son and as he's carrying him back to his bed, the son asks him a very odd question. The son says, Baba, how much money do you make? Okay, how much money do you make per hour? Okay. And the Baba says, the father says that, you know, he was kind of annoyed that, you know, why is my son asking me how much money do I make, right? So he just makes up a number. He says, I make $20 an hour. Okay. I make $20 an hour, right? He was angry that, you know, the father was angry that here I am working so hard to try to put, you know, to try to give my children a good upbringing, to put a roof over their head, to pay the bills. And here's my son who's so materialistic that he's asking me, how much money am I making per hour, okay? So he put him to bed, he put the boy to bed and didn't even read him a story, he didn't say goodnight. He was just upset that why did my son ask this question? So the next night, the father again comes home late, his wife is asleep, the food is there on the counter. And the next night again, he sees his son waiting for him. And so again, he says, you know, what's going on? He's becoming frustrated again that why is my son waiting for me? So this time the son doesn't ask him anything, but then he says, you know, Baba, can I have uh, $5? Okay, can I please have $5? So again, the father is again frustrated and he carries the boy to his room and he puts him into the bed and he says, okay, here's your $5. Don't wait for me. You need to go to sleep, right? Why are you waiting for me? So then the third night comes. The third night comes. The father then goes to work. He comes back again very late. His wife is sleeping. Dinner's on the counter. And this time he sees his son in the kitchen, but his son is kind of shrunken up and he's kind of looking down shy and he's very, and he looks kind of sad. And the son is holding his piggy bank, right? He keeps his money in a jar, a piggy bank. And he walks up to the father and he says, uh, he takes his piggy bank and he empties it onto the table, okay? And his father says, what are you doing? You're making a mess. All the coins and bills are falling out. And he says, Baba, Baba, I'm becoming, a, he says, Baba, I wanted to let you know that I finally have $20 and I want to buy one hour of your time. Okay. I want to buy one hour of your time. So here's $20. Thanks, SubhanAllah. So the building block 
So how do children spell love, right? How do children spell that love that you need to give them, right? It's not L-O-V-E, it's T-I-M-E, right? T-I-M-E, right? The building block of any sort of relationship that you have, anytime you want to build a relationship with someone, a necessary condition for that relationship is time. Okay? You can't say that, you know, someone at work, I'm going to have a relationship, but I'm not spending any time. It doesn't work like that, right? So similarly with children, we have to spend that time in order to understand their thoughts, in order to understand their fears, their personality, their joy, etc. Right? And then that also teaches us how we should treat them, how we should act with them. Right? Time can be anything together, right? Doesn't mean you know you have to set a strict time. Okay, this is my time with children, right? It can be something very low key. You know, we're gonna go out to eat at this restaurant. We're going to go to watch a movie together. We're going to go to the masjid together, right? We are gonna go play this sports game together. As long as you're doing something together, then that is time, right? And that's fulfilling this this idea, right? Financial security is also important, and I'm not trying to downplay that, right? Money is important. But money can't teach your children. It cannot help them build a relationship with God. Right? It's not going to be something that teaches them to live their lives in a moral and ethical way. Right? And in fact, if you look at studies that have been done, they, should, they say that when you're earning money, there's actually a point of diminishing returns. Right? When you're earning income, then at some point, once your salary goes up to a certain level, it doesn't really matter how much higher you go, you're still going to be as happy as you were when you were at that lower point once you get to a certain threshold, right? So there's really no point in keep on, there is a point sometimes if you're doing it for a good reason, but we also need to realize we have these other uh, obligations. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one of the challenges that I have is that at least try to, for the parents here, that try to have at least one meal a day together as a family, right? For most families, that's dinner. Right? But if you work late, for example, it could be breakfast or something like that. Try to have at least one meal together with everybody present sitting there at the table. Now when I say that, sit together at the table, I don't mean that you know, one person has their iPhone out, one person has their iPod out, one person has their MacBook Pro out. You know, everybody's on their own technology, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that you put all that stuff away and then you interact with the people that you are family members with. Right? And if you cannot commit to four dinners, four meals per week together, at least, you know, one, four days where you're going to have one meal together, then at least just try to make some sort of commitment to spend some more time with your children. Okay. The second point that I'd like to share, so the first point I think is very basic, but it's very, very important, and that's time. The second point that I'd like to share is to have an excellent relationship with your spouse. Okay. Have an excellent, good relationship with your wife or your husband. Okay. The fastest way to set up your child for um, failure in terms of his uh, moral compass, his spiritual compass, is to have a negative or bad relationship with your spouse, especially in front of that child, right? Because we know from psychology that whatever the child sees, he's going to do this in his own relationship, right? It doesn't matter how much, uh, how much akhlaq, how much Islam he's been taught. If he sees some sort of abuse happening in his parents, Actually, psychologists say that those children are the most likely children to, in fact, abuse their own parents, uh, abuse their own spouses when they become fathers and, and, and mothers, right? They're the ones who are going to be abusive themselves, no matter how good of children they are, because they saw that, right? And similarly, if, you know, for example, if you have daughters, you know, your daughter is going to grow up and want to marry somebody who's like you, right? So if in your relationship with your wife, you're never home, you're never happy, you're never affectionate, you know, you're always negative, you're sarcastic, you know, you're critical, then don't be surprised that one day your daughter is also going to look for a man who is like this, right? Because this is what she's seen, this is normal to her. This operates at a subliminal level, okay? So, the most important thing here, and I realize that not every relationship is easy, not every relationship is good, there are real challenges in some marriages, right? Um, so I'm not saying that you have to cover everything up and pretend, no, that's actually a bad idea to try to pretend like there's no problems. But at the very least, try never to. One of the teachings we have in uh, our Islamic akhlaq is that you should never have an argument or a fight in front of your children. Right? Never have a fight in front of children. Right? Because this creates some sort of harmful or destructive atmosphere that the children actually want to run away from. Right? They don't want to be there if they don't find that peace there in their house. Right? We see in Surah Al-Nahal, 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu ja'ala lakum min buyutikum sakana. This is the last point I'm making, but this is an important point. Wallahu ja'ala lakum min buyutikum sakana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made your homes a place of rest. Your buyut, your homes, a place of rest. Okay? Sakana, the word sakan or maskan in Arabic means a house, right? It means a house, uh, a home. But in Arabic, we know that every word comes from a three-letter root, right? So the root that this word sakan or maskan comes from, sakana, is actually the same root as a word that we're all, uh, we're all aware of, which is sukun. Okay? So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that your home is actually a place of sukun and tranquility and peace. Right? That's what your home is. That's what a house is. If it doesn't have that sukun, then it's not really a house. Right? So let's strive to make our, the four walls of our house at least a place of sukun for ourselves, for our children, for our husband, for our wife, etc. Because as we've said, the children who don't find that sukun at their house, they're going to look for that sukun somewhere else. And they're going to go somewhere else and they'll find that sukun eventually, right? But it might not be under the teachings that you've given them. It might not be in Islam. It might not be in Shia Islam. God forbid. Right? So let's try to make our houses a place of sukun. So.